Okay, good morning uh, all. Uh, welcome to the day two of the conference. And um, this is the first uh, plenary talk on day two. And uh, we have a distinguished scientist uh, with us, Professor N.T. Gwen from uh, Griffith University. So I'd briefly introduce the speaker and then uh, I would uh, pass it on to Professor Gwen for uh, the talk. So Professor N.T. Gwen uh, is a professor at uh, Griffith University. And I can say that he's one of the most renowned researchers in the field of micro and nanofluidics. Professor Gwen received his degrees from uh, Chemnitz University of Technology, Germany, and did his postdoc at um, Berkeley Sensors and Actuator Center. He's a fellow of ASME and uh, a senior member of IEEE. His research is focused on uh, a range of uh, areas, microfluidics, nanofluidics, micro nanomachining, micro nanoscale science and instrumentation for uh, biomedical applications. He has published uh, more than 500 journal papers and filed uh, eight patents, three of which are granted. And he has written many books, in particular his books, Fundamentals and Applications of Microfluidics and uh, Micromixture are very popular among the microfluidics community. With this uh, brief introduction, I once again invite Professor Enti Gwen for uh, a talk. Over to uh, you. Thank you, Ashish, for the introduction. And uh, good morning from Australia. So as um, introduced, my name is Nam Chung Nguyen from Griffith University, and I'm the director of Queensland Micro and Nanotechnology Center. So let me give you a, a short introduction uh, to the uh, center. Uh, we have here at, um, at Brisbane, so we are based on a Nathan campus in Brisbane in the state of Queensland in, in uh, Australia. And uh, we um, cover a range of research activities in micro and nanotechnology. So for micro technology, now we use the standard top-down approach, making uh, micro devices using uh, conventional uh, lithography techniques. And for nanotechnology, we have a range of uh, technologies to build up devices from the atomic scale. And of course, uh, what I'm doing is uh, in between these two areas, which is uh, micro and nano systems. And that is a multidisciplinary area where we deal with uh, microfluidics, biosensing, and biomedical applications. Um, we have our own clean room. So all the devices um, uh, are made uh, in house. Uh, the three major um, facilities we have at the centers are the clean room where we fabricate our devices. Um, another uh, center or another facility is the hydrogen materials facility where we focus our activities on, on hydrogen as, as a fuel, as energy storage. And um, of course, we also have characterization facilities for micro and nanoscale um, materials and devices. Now let me go straight to the topics of the talk today. So I'm going to uh, introduce today a relatively new area of microfluidics and uh, I coin it as microelastofluidics. And you may, uh, you may hear similar terms such as flexible microfluidics or stretchable microfluidics, but I think the overarching, overarching uh, terms for what we are doing in this area is better described by the terms of microelastofluidics. So you look at the schematics uh, here on the, um, on the slides, similar to conventional microfluidics, we have uh, digital microelastofluidics where fluid are handled in a discrete way or in a, in a small droplets, but different than conventional droplets. We have a format called liquid marbles, and we'll talk more about that. So liquid marbles is a droplet coated with microscopic or uh, nanoscopic uh, powders. So the liquid marbles behave 
similar to a salt solid, but it's actually liquid. And that's why this belongs to our concept, elastofluidic. So the liquid marble is elastic. So I will show you some results to see how, how elastic this platform is. Uh, another discrete platform is called um, elastic capsule, or we also call it um, liquid core solid shells uh, bits or liquid bits, which is actually a liquid uh, droplet encapsulated by a polymer capsule. So it's like a balloon, like a water balloon, but in a micro scale. Now on the other side, <clears throat> we have continuous flow micro elastofluidics. And in this area, we utilize the flexibilities and stretchabilities of materials to enhance um, mass transfer. So I don't talk about heat transfer here, but if we have enhanced mass transfer, we also can enhance heat transfer, but I haven't uh, gone into heat transfer application yet. So all of our applications uh, today are on enhancing uh, mass transfer for mixing and separation applications. So mainly for biomedical applications. Now, in this continuous flow microelastrofluidics area, uh, we can look at uh, stretchabilities or flexibilities in the molecular, molecular scale. That means we trace or we um, introduce into the liquid uh, long chain polymer molecules, which are stretchable. And that makes the liquid in the system become viscoelastic and a viscoelastic fluid behave differently than the conventional Newtonian fluid. And that lead to new effects, we can, which can be used for enhanced mixing and uh, separation. Now on the other side, at the device scale, uh, the flexibilities of the device uh, may also introduce new functionalities. So if you look at the emerging application of wearable systems, so we talk about systems which is attached to the skin or implanted in the body, uh, all these systems are flexible and the microfluidics components of these systems has to be adapted to the new platform. And that's why we have all these um, new functionalities just based on stretching, bending, folding, or twisting. So I will show some examples of, of, on how we use this kind of um, uh, elastic capabilities in the device case to enhance heat and uh, enhance mass transfer. All right, so that is a broad overview. I'm going to go through the different uh, subtopics and show you our recent works on each of the topics and see where and, and show you where are the application areas of this uh, micro elastofluidic subtopic. Now the first topic is liquid marbles. And uh, as I mentioned, liquid marbles is a liquid droplet coated with um, microscopic powders or particles. And in, in contrast to a conventional droplet, um, a liquid marble is non wetting because the liquid doesn't have direct contact to the substrate with the substrate below it. And we usually use the hydrophobic powder, powders or the Teflon powder as a coating materials. And these materials allow us to isolate the liquid from the solid uh, um, uh, surface at the bottom of the liquid marbles. Uh, these non wetting behaviors actually lead to a number of interesting um, characteristics of this kind of soft droplet. Uh, the first one is now instead of having a droplet, now we have an elastic soft platform, which is compressible, or which is elastic. That means when we compress it and release the strain of the stress, we will get back to the original shape. So you look on, on this slide, you can see the compressibilities of a liquid marbles. And the uh, stress strain behavior can be seen in the, the graph down here, but normalized in uh, strains times more number versus the, um, the stress times more number versus the strain. So we 
tested the behavior across different um, uh, liquid types and powder types and all all the you now um, um, stress strain curve after normalizing fall to a single line which clearly show a nonlinear behavior right so this means a liquid marbles is elastic but it's become stiffer if the strain becomes larger so you can compress it flatly and by by the you now at a certain range the um, the strain increases uh, sharply but the behavior is hysteresis free that means when you reverse the curve release the stress the original shape returns so that's why liquid marbles is one of our uh, micro elastofluidic uh, platform as I, men I mentioned at the beginning of the talk Another interesting behavior of this platform is because the, 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 um, the coating powder is hydrophobic, we can place the whole liquid marbles on a free liquid surface. And because of the uh, small air cap between the liquid marbles and the surface, the liquid marble can float on the surface. So uh, what you see here is our experimental setup using an X-ray uh, tomography system to look at the interface of a floating liquid marbles. And the behavior is interesting. A floating liquid marbles sitting on a free surface, not only deform itself, but also deform the free surface. And of course, the behavior depends on the bond number, which is the ratio between the, you know, the, the gravity and the surface tension. So the larger the droplet, the more deformed is the liquid marbles. And of course, also the more deformed is the free surface. Uh, we use this platform later for cell cancer. So I will show you some application later. But interestingly, looking at this kind of uh, system, we see that uh, contact angles, meniscus angles, which are represented for the deformations of the liquid marbles and the free surface are both function of bond number. And of course, the if the surface, free surface of the liquid is deformed, it will form a, a, a surface tension force uh, pushing up the liquid marbles. So the larger the bond number, the larger is the uh, surface, tension, surface tension force as well. That means the liquid marbles not only help um, now by the buoyancy force, not by the replaced volume of the liquid, but also by the surface tension of the free surface. Now, as I mentioned before, if you want to use this platform for cell culture, you want to mix uh, the liquid inside the liquid marbles. And we need to establish a number of technologies to, to act act actuate this uh, salt droplet. So you may uh, see that in conventional digital microfluidics, we can use uh, electro wetting, we can use a magnetic force to move a droplet around on a, on a planar surface. So in this case, we can use similar forces as well. So what you see on this video is a liquid marbles activate, um, activated by, by an external magnet. So all we need to do is to trace or is to introduce some uh, magnetic bits inside the uh, liquid marbles and use an external magnet to move it back and forth. And uh, the behavior of the liquid marbles, of course, depending on the strength of the magnetic force and also the speed of the movement because the speed determines the friction. Even those a floating, floating liquid marbles has a minimum friction force, but this friction force is still preset because we have a contact areas between the uh, floating liquid marbles and the free surface. And uh, you see here the operation map uh, of this platform. So the distance the, the, in the first diagram, the distance from the magnet to the liquid marbles versus the speed. So we see that the, the closer the distance and the slower the speed, 
the easier the liquid marble can follow the external magnet. So the uh, left uh, bottom corner is the area where we can use to operate the liquid marbles. <clears throat> right, so on the right, of course, the concentration of the magnetic bits or magnetic particles inside the liquid marbles also um, determines how large the magnetic force is. So the upper left corner is the operation range of, um, of our platform. Now, there are many other ways to, to, you know, to, operate, to run a floating liquid marbles. So you see on this slide, an interesting way, the self-propelling liquid marbles. So what we have here is a liquid marbles, which is mixed with ethanol. So ethanol, the video doesn't work, but the ethanol is, um, uh, um, can evaporate out of the liquid marbles and deposit back on the surface, on the sphere surface of the, of the liquid uh, surface beneath. And because ethanol uh, concentration is distributed, we have a gradient of surface tension on the free surface. And this gradient drive the liquid marbles around. So if the video works, you can see that uh, the ethanol water mixture, liquid marbles will float around um, um, on the free surface. Same thing here, actually, you cannot see the video. But if you place this ethanol liquid marbles in a circular track, the liquid marble will move around and around until all the ethanol uh, evaporates. So on the right, you can see uh, the results of the movement. And uh, of course, the durations of the movement depends on how much fuel or how much ethanol we have in the liquid marbles. Right, so the larger the, 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 the liquid marbles, the more fuel we have and the longer the movement can be sustained. Right, so the next concept to uh, manipulate the liquid marbles is uh, electrostatic concept. So uh, the force used here is uh, the dielectrophoretic force, which is, which attracts um, uh, neutral, uh, no, neutral uh, particles to the place where they have high, uh, send, uh, high uh, gradient of, of the fields. So on top, we have electrodes, and at the bottom is the liquid marbles. And uh, you can see on this video, the demonstration, when we activate the, the electrodes or apply a voltage to the electrode, we can pick up the liquid marbles, move it to some places, and then release it by taking away the uh, high voltage. So we use this concept to develop a pick and place um, a pipetting system, so similar to a conventional liquid pipette. Uh, we can pick up and release liquid marbles uh, in our assays. Uh, the same concept can also be used to move liquid marbles around on a free surface. All right, so the same force that attracts the liquid marble up can also drive it uh, laterally. And because the friction is, is uh, very small, uh, now we can use uh, this relatively small force to move uh, liquid marbles around. So this kind of movement allows us to move the liquid marbles and also mix the contents of the liquid marbles inside. And of course, we develop a mathematical models for the electric fields and calculate the force and also the uh, movement of the liquid marbles uh, under these fields. So the configuration can be used to track liquid marbles on a field surface or to uh, track it, to trap it in a position. Right, so uh, the diagram here you see here is the operation map for trapping uh, liquid marbles as function of the applied voltage and the, you know, the distance between the liquid marbles and, and the electrodes. Uh, the blue circles are the areas where the liquid marbles can be trapped. So you now we have different maps for different sizes. And of course, the smaller the liquid marbles, the easier you can attract to the electrodes. 
but for most of the uh, operation map, you can see that the upper left corner is the area where we can trap liquid marbles, floating liquid marbles. So a high voltage and a short distance will make sure that we can trap a floating liquid marbles. Now, electrostatic force not only can be used to move liquid marble around or trap them, but also uh, for controlling the formation uh, of the droplet and liquid marbles. So what you see here is a setup where we use uh, the uh, voltage to form, to pull a liquid droplet out of a needle. And with the voltage, we control the volume of the droplet and the subsequent volume of the liquid marbles. So that means we have a well-controlled and uh, closed loop feedback for liquid, liquid marble formations uh, using this setup. Um, now, both closed loop and uh, open loop control can be utilized. So of course, for closed loop, we need to run the formation frequency at a lower speed because our computer needs some time to process the size and adjust the voltage of the system. But theoretically, we can uh, control and form liquid marbles with any size uh, uh, we, wish, we wish. Now, uh, there is one disadvantage, or say one drawback of liquid marble system. Uh, that is the problem of coalescence. So we know that the coating of the liquid marbles is so stable because you now the surface tension force in microstates is dominant. Uh, once uh, the droplet is coated with micro particles, it is very difficult to destroy it, difficult to open it up, to merge two liquid marbles together. So you just saw on the video, the attempt to drop one liquid marbles on the other one, and they just don't merge, they just bounce away uh, from each other. Now, instead of head-on uh, collision, if we, we just move them on the side a bit, then if we slide them on, open the, uh, <clears throat> open the coat, powder coating a bit, so that liquid can, can, can uh, contact each other, then we can have coalescence, as you see on the second videos I just show on the slide. Um, so coalescence is needed because uh, for most assays, we need to have mixing of two components inside the liquid marbles. And uh, we analyze the condition for uh, coalescence as a um, function of impact uh, velocity. That means how high the droplet uh, of the marbles is held. And also as function of the offset ratio. That means the distance between one liquid marbles to the others. And of course, uh, there is an optimum, optimum values for uh, for this, uh, for the uh, uh, coalescent condition. And we, we analyze the energy needed to open up a liquid marbles, or say to overcome the surface tension energy of a liquid marbles and calculate back the required kinetic energy or potential energy uh, needed to drop the liquid marble down. And uh, we work out the modified Weber number, which is the ratio between the kinetic energy and the surface tension energy. And through our series of experiments, uh, we figure out that a uh, modified Weber number of 0 0.6, more than 0 0.6, is the condition for two liquid marbles to coalesce. So that means we have, need to have enough uh, kinetic energy to overcome the, the surface tension of a liquid marble. So collision is, is not, not, not a neat solution for, uh, for surface tension or for liquid marble coalescence. But um, at the moment, we, we only investigated uh, this concept. There are many other concepts to weaken the surface tension 
uh, that can enable uh, uh, coalescence, which could be the future works uh, of, of this area. Now here, I would like to show you um, a few applications of the liquid marble platforms. So we, we actually uh, use this platform for cell culture and particularly to grow three-dimensional uh, tissues for implantations. Right? So we want to have, um, we want to grow cells to implant back into injury place, particularly for um, spinal cord injury, with the hope that the nerve ends can, can, be, can be grown and connect back together. And for this uh, kind of cell therapy or, or implantation therapy, we need to have a nice uh, three-dimensional cell culture, which is not possible with conventional two-dimensional two assay, and also not possible with uh, accessor droplet or hanging drop uh, uh, platforms. So you can see here using liquid marbles because you can float them on a free surface. Cell can associate and, and connect together in a natural way. So you can have very healthy three-dimensional uh, uh, tissue culture and the spheroids or the 3D cell tissue we, uh, we obtain from this assay is uh, healthy from inside out. So conventional methods results into a dead core. That means most of the uh, spheroids or of the cell tissue is dead inside, but our methods allow us to grow uh, spheroids uh, tissue, which is alive across the uh, 3D structure. Uh, we can also culture uh, different shapes of this tissue. In this case, which is a toroid or a donut shape uh, cell culture. Uh, and by doing so, we put in a mold inside liquid marbles, which is uh, the sphere I see inside the liquid marbles here. And cell grow around it and form a, form a ring like tissue. And this ring, uh, ring like tissue is actually a three-dimensional wound model. So we know that to test drug, to see how drug can help cell to grow back together to heal the wound. Um, uh, conventionally, people use a 2D assay and make a scratch on the assay and see how cell grow back. But this format doesn't, uh, this platform doesn't represent the surreal situation. How uh, uh, donut shaped tissue uh, represent the real wound healing assay. And you can see on the, on the uh, um, series of um, uh, images here, how the donut shaped tissue uh, grow back and close the hole in the middle after uh, two days. All right, so we can use the same platform for different uh, uh, investigation that mimics, mimics the in vitro um, conditions. But in this case, again, with applications uh, for spinal cord injury, we use liquid marbles to model um, the injury place to see how cell grow and handles nerve debris around them. And now the floating liquid marbles uh, platform can uh, serve this purpose very well. And you can see what happens under uh, in vitro condition is similar to what happens inside the body in the injury place. Now we look also further now to grow cell and, and insert it back or implant it back into the injury place. We need to have a cell from a patient's body, uh, conserve them and, and regrow them. And the liquid marbles platform can also be used to conserve and freeze cells. So you can see here uh, a method where we uh, encapsulate harvested cell from, from, from the body into a liquid uh, marbles. And then uh, the trick here is to have a, a, a hydrogel sphere inside uh, to preserve the cells without cryoprotectants. So normally to preserve cells, we need to add cryoprotectants to avoid the liquid contents in the cells to, to become ice and destroy the cell walls. And with the liquid marbles, 
We don't need to have this kind of protectants and cell are still resolved. So this technology is important because cryoprotectants will contaminate the cells. And for many clinical applications, we cannot have anything else um, inside the cell when we implant back into the body. So cryoprotectant-free freezing is one of the very uh, important conditions for the later applications um, of uh, cell therapy. And liquid marbles can be used for that. Now, another application for liquid marbles as uh, digital microfluidic platforms is a polymerase chain reaction. So we just demonstrate that this little droplet coated with um, hydrophobic powder can be used as a micro reactor for polymerase chain reaction. And we just build uh, a thermal cycle and place these liquid bubbles into the thermal cycle to you now to diagnose and to identify some uh, materials, um, uh, samples. And you can see here, we can, after a few cycles, we can see uh, the PCR signal pickups. So we see the fluorescent signals and the fluorescent signals show up means uh, we have detected uh, 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 you know, samples of the DNA samples of a certain DNA, of a certain bacterial uh, strains um, in the assay. Right, so those are the few application of uh, liquid marbles as one of the digital micro elastofluidic platform. So the next platform I want to show you here is um, the elastic capsules or a liquid droplet encapsulated with a solid uh, polymer. So unlike uh, liquid marbles, this platform has, has a tight and solid encapsulation. This means there's no pores, gas cannot permit through the um, uh, through the um, uh, shelves. The advantage of this platform is uh, it doesn't evaporate, right? Liquid marbles still allows the content to evaporate. And we notice it, there is a big problem if you put it on a thermal cycles, a cycler for PCR reaction, the content will evaporate away. Now, if we encapsulate the samples in a solid shell, water cannot escape. So that's why we have this elastic microcapsule. Now the concept of this elastic microcapsule is uh, relatively simple. So we use microfluidic uh, device to form uh, local dimensions. That means we have a, a two uh, droplet in droplet uh, platform, either oil in polymer solution or water in polymer solution droplets. So the key uh, condition for this technology is that the external droplet should consist of a, a photosensitive polymer that is curable under UV lights or blue lights. So this polymer allows us to encapsulate either oil contents or water aqueous contents. So on the right, we see uh, now the uh, local emulsions. And at the bottom are the SEM images of the capsules, which, um, which are solidified or fixed with the UV light, right? So we can get capsules with diameters on the order of 100 micrometers. And that is, that is good for applications such as PCR, as I, I will show you uh, later on. Um, our objective with this uh, micro capsule is uh, to go into uh, digital PCR where we, instead of amplifying the whole bulk solution, we divide the DNA samples into small droplets and then amplify now all the droplets. And if there is one single DNA strand exists in a droplet, the whole uh, droplet will light up um, under fluorescent light, uh, under excitation light. All right, so to show the elasticity or the flexibility of this capsule, we also carry out um, compressing, uh, compression experiments uh, for this capsule and determine what is the critical force needed to destroy the capsule. 
uh, because for some applications, if we use the capsule as storage for reagents, we need to know how much force we need to apply to release the content of the capsule. And similarly, we can also use heat to destroy the capsule. So if we heat up the contents, the thermal expansions will, uh, uh, will induce a stress or pressure to the, to the capsule wall or the shell and break it at a certain critical temperature. And here you see the results of our compression experiments. The behavior is similar to what we observe with liquid marbles. That means the compression behavior is not linear, but it's not that, no, at a higher displacement, it not, doesn't change uh, steeply as, as the liquid marbles. That means our elastic microcapsule uh, behave more like a solid, more like a solid than a, a liquid, right? It's, it's closer to a pure a solid bit. And of course, if the displacement is too large or the force too high, uh, the capsule will rupture. And we, we know where is the critical condition to rupture the, the capsules and release its contents. So here are the uh, uh, results of this maximum uh, rupture force. And of course, it depends on the ratio between the thickness of the capsule of the shell and the diameters of the droplets. So you can see on the right hand side, we almost have a linear relationship within these two parameters. If the ratio of the thickness and the diameters is large, we also need to have a relatively large uh, rupture, um, rupture force. Um, now, there are also an easier way to, uh, to break the, the shells, that is just heating it up. So we know that um, at a higher temperature, the liquid will expand. Some liquid, if we pass the boiling point, there is a phase transition from liquid to, to vapor, and that happened more explosively, and that's destroyed the, 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 the capsule faster. But uh, in this case, we have oil with a boiling temperature uh, it's much higher than 100 degrees, and we are able to uh, open up the capsules at the relatively low temperature. That means temperature lower the boiling problem than the boiling temperature. So heating is potentially an easy way to release the contents of a microcapsule. Right. So I have talked about the digital micro elastofluidics. Now we move to uh, continuous flow micro elastofluidics. And, and the first topics I will briefly uh, introduce here is viscoelastic flows. So this work um, has been done quite a, a long time ago. So actually our group did it over 13 years ago. And the concept is relatively simple. We mix uh, uh, the liquid mix into the liquid uh, uh, polymer with a relatively long chain. And in this case is PEO, polyethylene oxide. And uh, the, the large molecules will be stretched if we have a extensional uh, strain of the flow and recoils when there is a subtle change in strain or stress in the flow. And this sudden change and recoiling and stretching will cause um, microscopic turbulence in, in the flow. And we call it uh, viscoelastic turbulence. And this viscoelastic turbulence can be utilized for enhancing uh, mixing uh, in, in a micro channel or in a micro mixer. Right, so you can see um, on, uh, on, the, on the right, the schematics of, of this kind of flow. So if you pass a viscoelastic liquid through a, um, 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 uh, you know, through a narrow channels, uh, recirculation flow will happen uh, now before, not before the, the entrance. Now for Newtonian, conventional Newtonian uh, liquid, such as water, 
the regulation will happen after the uh, constriction. Right, so you can see here uh, the, the PIV measurement tracing of particles as well as uh, uh, no, uh, fluorescent dye tracing. On the left is the flow of water. So we can see the recirculation happens after, you know, after the constriction, flow is from right to left. On the right hand side is how viscoelastic flow behaves. Uh, recirculation happens in front of the constriction. And after the constriction, the liquid is fully mixed now because you now uh, this plastic uh, turbulence happens in front and also after the, the constriction. Now, this elastic flow not only can be used for mixing, but also for the opposite application of separation. So, by mixing um, a PEO or this long chain polymer inside the liquid, uh, we can enhance uh, particle separation for initial microfluidics. Now you know that initial microfluidics try to uh, now, uh, utilize this initial force and drug force to separate particles of different sizes and density. So in this case, we add, <clears throat> now we add in addition to, to the um, Initial force, we add a viscoelastic force to push the, liquid, the particle further. And just by, by mixing uh, the carry liquid with viscoelastic uh, molecules, we can enhance separation uh, of particles. So on the right hand side, you can see the red and green fluorescent particles are separated uh, using uh, this visco, uh, elasto inertial. Uh, microfluidic sponsor. Now I'm moving to the next platform of micro viscoelastic, which is uh, stretchable microfluidics. You may hear more about this in the near future, especially uh, with the emerging applications of um, wearable uh, systems, right? So we need this stretchable system for either wearable uh, microfluidics or even for desktop-based microfluidics. So what I show you here is how to utilize um, flexible microfluidic device, uh, devices to enhance uh, uh, fluidic functions, right? So conventionally, rigid microfluidics <clears throat> have to work with a fixed geometry, fixed channels, which are designed on a mass and transfer to the device, like on the left-hand side. Um, in contrast, on the right hand side, our flexible stretchable microfluidics can be deformed. Actually, we made our devices of PDMS, the same material, material as rigid microfluidics, but we make it so thin that we can stretch them or twist them. And stretching and twisting enables new function. Right? So, we, I mentioned before uh, about inertial microfluidics. So, uh, now, conventionally, we have initial migration of particles if the channel is fixed. And of course, the focusing length or the place where the, the, the particles are focused depends on the channel geometry. And channel geometry means the cross section of the channels and also the length of the channels. And <clears throat> conventionally, now in a straight channels, if we introduce particles into a long and straight channels, larger particles will be pushed to the center of the channels and smaller particles to the side, right? So if we tap the channels uh, at the exit in the middle, we can separate large particles. But of course, uh, this behavior depends on the uh, flow rates and the length of the channel. Now to test the concept of uh, stretchable elastomicrofluidics, we vary the length of the microchannels to tune uh, the, 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 uh, tune the separations behavior. And our application here is um, to separate circulating tumor cells. So we know that when cancer start to spread, uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, circulating tumor cells circulate in, in the you know, blood circulation. 
And once they uh, stuck to a certain organs and spread out there, the, the cancer spread in the body. So it's important to take the blood samples and detect the, the presence of these circulating uh, tumor cells. And our technology is designed for this. So on, the, on this slide, you see the concept of our separation. Now, normally, if, if the device is rigid, we need to tune the length by designing the device. That means you need to make the mass, fabricate the device all over again, test with the flow rate, then you know what is the right uh, operation condition to separate uh, cancer cells, which are the blue dot slash blue dot in the, in the image. With stretchable microfluidics, we can tune the length of the channels. Right? The more you stretch, the longer is the channels. And we tune it until we have the right length to only get the cancer cells to, now to, to exit the middle channels of our device. And here is our concept. So we de designed the device so that we have a middle section, which is flexible and stretchable. And we mount this on a, on a stretching device. And that is a conventional um, you know, X position, precision position system. So we can precisely adjust the length of the device depending on the size of the particles we want to separate. And we can place the whole setup under microscope to observe the behavior of our device. And um, clearly you can see on, on, on the left-hand side, without stretching, you no know, particles uh, spread all over the, the section, uh, all over the cross section of the channels. The more we stretch, the more focused is the, um, the particles. And at about six millimeters, uh, stretching or say additional six millimeters in length of the whole device, uh, we have all the particles focused in the center, in the center line of the channels. And that is the condition where we can separate uh, particles. All right, so here is a summary of, of the, you know, of the uh, optimal condition where the, uh, you know, the, the maximum purity or the best condition for, for particle separation uh, as a function as of the stretching length. Right, and we tested it with two separate cancer cell and uh, white blood cells. So you know that white blood cell is relatively large compared to red blood cells. And the concerns in most separation technique is to separate uh, cancer cells and, red, uh, and, and, and white blood cells. And in the, now in the images you see here, we clearly can separate uh, cancer cells in the middle channels at the center line of our system by stretching it to six millimeters which is the optimal length for cancer cells, right? And of course we, we tested, we, we count the cancer cells at the exit, we collect the results at the exit and compare the results you know, without stretching and with optimal stretching. The bottom row is the weights out, 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 outlet. So you can see that at the outlets at six millimeters, most of the cancer cells landed in the center line, center outlet, and none uh, get to the side outlets. So that means we can get a, a relatively high purity of the separation. Right, so here's again, is the results for recovery rate, rejection ratio, and purity of cancer cells. So uh, next is another application of stretchable microfluidics. And in this case, we, we use stretching to enhance mixing. So we know that um, uh, by stretching, we can change curvature of channels. And in this case, we just demonstrated simply by designing a meandering uh, liquid uh, channels, right? So I will move uh, quick here, only a few slides left. And by stretching the device, I change the curvature and change the beam vortices in the micro channels, and so enhance mixing. And even to enhance mixing even better, we stretch it vertically 
So changing the curvature politically over time. And on the right hand side, you can see that that one hertz, we can get the best uh, uh, mixing results. Right, so both simulations and uh, experiments show that uh, stretching your micro mixer, we can enhance mixing uh, index of a device. And I'm at the end of my presentation. So I have uh, introduced the, the field of micro elastofluidics. I show you what we meant by, uh, by this area. And there are two areas, major areas of this field. One is the digital micro elastofluidics. And we have liquid marbles and elastic uh, capsules are the two major platforms. And for continuous flow microelastofluidics, we have viscoelastic uh, microfluidics and flexible stretchable devices. Right? And what I see as a large application areas or um, you know, an area where we may have a lot of potential um, works going on is uh, in the application of wearable devices. Right, so uh, I return it back to you and welcome your uh, questions. Thank you, Professor Gwen. Uh, now it's uh, time for uh, some questions. Audience uh, may ask question by typing in the chat box. So um, while uh, audience is uh, thinking about question, uh, uh, can I uh, ask a couple of questions that I have? So um, this is regarding uh, your uh, presentation on uh, the liquid marble. Uh, in the initial slides, uh, uh, you had shown uh, these uh, liquid marbles are covered uh, by uh, microscale particles. So yeah. for the benefit of our audience, can you tell us how it is prepared? So we, we, we bought um, uh, off the shelf uh, micro particles. You can buy, buy from Sigma Andrick standard Teflon powder, one micrometers inside. Of course, it doesn't uh, depend on the type of particles. You can have you now particles from sub-micrometer size all the way to 10, 20 micrometers, right? So, and even the particles doesn't need to be hydrophobic, right? This can be hydrophilic, but now you have a uh, nanoporous structure on the particles. So, uh, it's, it's a variety of particles you can use. So is the droplet rolled over these particles or uh, I mean, how, how is it? Uh... Yes, so the, the easiest way to prepare liquid marbles is to drop a liquid droplet on a powder bed. So on a, not on a surface coated with the powder and roll it around. But we also develop an automated system where we have a con well-controlled dispensing uh, system and also shaking platform where you can form them in a controlled way. Right. So uh, a related question uh, is on slide seven, uh, if you may, uh, slide seven. Check the slide seven. All right. So here, uh, um, does the particle size of uh, this uh, behavior that uh, you're showing? Um, practically, no. The particle size actually affects the, um, uh, not the uh, apparent uh, surface tension of the liquid marbles. But because we normalize it with a bond number, so no, whatever surface tension we have, we always fit into this curve. No, because the apparent surface tension also depends on the way the particles act on the on the liquid surface. So we have uh, recent works on uh, discussing on how you now how preparation method, powder types affect the apparent surface tension, right? But for this kind of behavior, it doesn't. I forget because this is a generalized curve. We already normalize the strain and the stress. So whatever surface tension you have, all your data will fit into this curve. The related, uh, related question, uh, I think you showed about uh, coalescence between uh, uh, liquid marbles. And uh, 
there was also um, the coalescence was observed and there was a slight offset. So uh, I'm curious to know what is the role of offset? Uh, does it introduce some kind of shear stress, et cetera? Uh, how does yeah. it so, I mean, coalescence? Yeah, so the key, the key things for uh, coalescence uh, liquid marbles is uh, destroying, destroying the, the, the coating, the powder coating. So whatever you do, if you can open up a small window for the liquid to touch each other, you can coalesce it. Right? And the offset actually is, is one of the methods, which slide not using share to open up a small window on, on the shelf. So when you have the windows open, liquid contacts, you have immediate coalescence. Right? So offset is just the, serve the purpose of opening this window. Okay. So we have um, more question. Uh, it's about how simulations of stretchable microfluidic channels are performed to match experiments. All right, so the simulation is quite straightforward. We, we use uh, Comzol, and Comzol allows multi-physics. That means you can, uh, can transfer the models of uh, different music uh, physics into each other. So we did simulation of micromixer, for example. So first we simulate the, uh, uh, the stretching, that means pure mechanics, and then adopt the geometry of the stretching, uh, stretching simulation into the fluid models, and then run the simulation of the fluid flow using uh, the fluid um, modules. So um, now this is a conventional multi-physics approach. So you simulate one physics, transfer it to the next physics, simulate again, and if needed, you can iterate the whole process to get the, the results done. A related question on uh, the stretchable microfluidics. So you saw that um, by stretching the channel, uh, you could uh, separate uh, particles, sort particles. So what is the benefit of uh, using a stretchable platform versus uh, just uh, simply using a rigid uh, microchannel uh, of uh, length? Now this of tunability is because if you use rigid channels, so you know that for initial microfluidics, the behavior of the separation behavior depends on too many parameters, right? This is flow rate, geometry, channel length, uh, density, size of the particles. And to get the optimal condition, most of the time you need to have a trial and error approach, right? You try out until you get the right parameters. And that is very costly and time consuming. Now, if you have a design which allows you to tune the geometry by stretching it, you can observe the optimal condition right away on the microscope, right? So you have one design, one experiment, and you get the design uh, uh, results, right? So let me cut down now weeks or months of experiments to a single day. So that is uh, the advantage. Right. So there is maybe one more question now. Uh, you may uh, answer this. So what is the difference between microfluidics and nanoparticles? Uh, I think there's a big difference. I think he may mean what is the difference between microfluidics and uh, maybe nanofluidics? Or yeah, probably, yeah, probably nanofluidics. Yeah, so this is a size. You know, microfluidics is about uh, you know, devices with channel size more than one micrometers. And I, I would say un, under 100 nanometers, we count it as a nanofluidic. So nano channels is channels you now with size less than 100 nanometers. So I do not see any more question uh, on the Q&A window. So, um, um, I would like to thank you uh, once again for uh, accepting our inv invitation and uh, thank you very much uh, for, an, uh, for a very exciting and interesting talk. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Thanks, so uh, sh should I leave this window or how can I continue to listen to other talks? Um, if you uh, want to listen to other talks, you have to exit from here and uh, oh. log in through our uh, webpage. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Still yeah.
Thank you.